Okay, so when we last left off, we were talking about return on assets, and I described to you how to calculate and the significance of return on assets. But I want to talk a little bit more about analyzing this return on assets field. Um, now, it's, it's important because it's a, it's a critical measure of profitability for a company. Uh, and it's a product of two factors. So we have the net income margin, which is net income divided by sales, and we have the turnover, which is sales divided by total assets, which the turnover shows us, as I described before, the, um, the number of times sales is of assets. So if assets are 100,000, sales are a million, you have, you have 10 turns. Now, if you take uh, net income div uh, divided by sales to get your uh, net income margin, and you multiply it by sales div uh, divided by total asset turnover, or basically net income margin times turnover, you are going to get the return on assets uh, ratio that way as well. So this is just important to remember when you're calculating return on assets, as we did back here, simply net profit after tax divided by total assets. That's one way of calculating it. But you could also do net income margin times turnover because those two ratios have all those other factors in it. But it's important to understand this because you see um, the, four, the four numbers, net income sales, or oh, three numbers, net income sales and total assets, how they relate to each other. So if the, so then you get an idea if the net income margin increases or the turnover rate increases, then the return on assets should increase because it's a multiplication. So you get a better idea of what, so if you want the return on assets to increase, you know that you've got to increase sales will help to increase the return on total assets. Uh, or you have to increase net income. So increasing net income or sales will, will help. Now, net income needs to increase at a faster percentage than sales. Because if sales increases, that does help the total, uh, the turnover of the assets. But it, if net income stays the same, then your net income margin is going to decrease. So it's sort of a balancing game. But ideally what you want is you want your sales to increase and you want your net income in relationship to sales to increase even more, to have a higher return to assets. So it's really a measure of efficiency. How, how efficient can I make these assets? Uh, you know, for example, your car is an asset, but for you it's a very inefficient asset because most of the time it sits in your driveway. If you could rent your car out when you're not using it, it would be a more efficient asset for you. So if you could efficiently, without burden, without a bother to you as far as when you need the car, it's there. On the, the days and times you don't need the car, somebody else is driving it and paying you for that privilege. That would be a more efficient asset. Maybe you could generate $2,000 a week of income from someone using, or maybe a month, $2,000 a week would be a bit much. Maybe in a month you can generate $2,000 worth of extra income by renting out your car when you're not using it. And that makes it a more efficient asset. So your net income, and your sales from that asset are increasing. Okay, so we're really looking at, based on the assets we have, how can we leverage them to generate, to, to create more service or more product that we can increase our sales. If we're a McDonald's restaurant, let's try and run 24 hours a day. And a few years ago, when McDonald's was, had very slow growth and things weren't happening the way they wanted to in their sales growth or their profitability, they encouraged and incentivized franchisers to stay open 24 hours a day. And some locations, like we have a location close uh, to campus, and that stays open 24 hours a day because there is business. And since McDonald's were open anyway from 5 a.m. to midnight on a routine basis, what's the extra five hours in costs to stay open? You know, if it generates extra sales and profits, it's worth it. If it doesn't, then you don't stay open. Okay. But that's just one point of the analysis. Now, if you break down the return on assets to those categories, you can identify those components to help drive the company profits. So net profit margin and total asset turnover have their own individual components. So this is what I'm talking about with the ratio. You want to break down the ratio and go to the individual accounts that 
uh, affect the ratio, that can increase it, make the ratio better. So it's not so much if you're analyzing a company from, say, a management perspective, as well as um, someone who's recommending the company, one of your recommendations can be if you're reviewing return on assets and you break down the accounts and you get an idea of how assets are growing in relationship to sales, you may have a situation where return on assets have declined. But you're not, you're not sure why because the sales of the company have increased and the profits of the company have increased. But if you look into the accounts, you'll see that they have, they have increased their assets faster than they have increased their sales or profits. So it's sort of like um, being a pizza store, increasing your sales of pizza by 10% and buying a whole second set of ovens so you can make the extra 10% of pizza. It really wasn't worth it because the cost of purchasing and the financing and the energy cost of those ovens um, far exceed the extra profits of the extra 10% of pizza you're selling. So analyzing return on assets could sometimes clue you in to things the company is doing that may make their assets more, uh, more not as efficient. So you want to know why, if return on assets are moving up or down, you want to know why, what is the root core, cause of this, um, what's improving it or what's deteriorating it. And that's when you, write, when you write an analyst report and you talk about return on assets, you have something to say other than, oh, return on assets are down, it went from 40% uh, to 30%. Uh, that's bad. But what you really should do is not just, you should back it up with understanding why that went down. Maybe it was because assets increased or sales decreased. Or, and, then, and then you could say, some, in some cases, it may have gone down because the company brought online a new factory. That wasn't fully, you know, it was factories brought online in the middle of the year. So it, didn't, it wasn't fully utilized for the full year. So it was making it look like their return to assets are lower. However, if that factory runs for a full 12 months next year at the capacity rates that they predict, this return to assets is going to improve significantly. So investors shouldn't sell the stock based on lower return on assets this year because there's an explanation for it. And in some cases, return on assets may go down because the because a customer a company may have ramped up inventory. Such was the case with Under Armour a few years ago. They ramped up inventory for their shoes and they had looked like they had a big uh, pile of unsold inventory, but what they were doing was getting, to, getting ready to launch their new shoe products so they needed to ramp up the inventory before they um, were able to send it out to stores and have a launch um, date and get all the inventory out to the customers. So in that particular quarter, their return on assets looked lower, so some analysts put negative ratings on them, the stock went down. And other analysts who were smarter said, well, this, this is not a problem. They are, they are going to sell this inventory next quarter, and they're just ramping it up for a big launch. And that's what makes the difference between an, an analyst who just cursorily looks over the numbers and makes judgments without understanding what's behind the numbers versus an analyst that looks behind the numbers and gets more of a story of what's happening. And in your case, you don't have all the tools of some of the analysts. They will actually call the company or you know, talk to some contacts, ask for a comment from the company. Uh, and in some other cases, just by reading the headline of the news of what the company's doing, you could see that okay, they're ready to launch a whole new product, a whole new third of their company is now going to be shoes they're adding to the company, or they bought another, they may have bought another company which could have raised assets, but they haven't yet booked any sales from it. There are, you know, a multitude of reasons that many of them you can uncover by just looking at the news events for the company. Just think of Apple launching their Apple Watch. None of them are in stores yet, so they must have made a huge amount of these Apple Watches that are sitting in, in Apple's inventory. But what's going to happen in the first two weeks this product's launched, they're going to sell everything and be sold out. So right before they launch, their inventory is going to look inflated and the return on assets is going to look lower. And then right after, two, a week or two after the launch, when they sell out of all that stock, suddenly the return on assets is going to look a lot better. So if you catch the financial reports before that, those sales happen, maybe you see the financial reports for the first quarter ending in March, and they will the return on assets for that because the watch don't look so good, but now you look at the second quarter, everything's been sold things look a lot better. So sometimes you have to kind of get an idea of what's behind the numbers. Okay. Return equity is also a very important number, percentage. And it's one of the most important ones because as an owner, equity is your, what you own. Just like if you have a house and there's a mortgage on the house and you say the house is worth 500,000, my mortgage is for 300,000, so your equity is the 200,000. That's what you really own. Own. 
So if that house was, uh, say, a rental property, and you were making money on that house, you would look at your return on equity, say you're making 20000 a year profit in the house, and you put 200000 down, your return is 10%. You don't look at the, you don't judge it by the full 500,000. You judge it by your equity, not the to, total value. So that's what we're turning the equity is: is looking at the equity part of the company, and then taking the um, the profits of the company and relating it to the return of the equity, the money you put in. You know, it's sort of like you can, if you want to open, say you have enough money to open up uh, one Subway franchise, and, and you need to put, um, you know, twenty thousand dollars down. Uh, actually, you want to pay the full amount. Say you pay $100,000 for the subway location. So you have one subway location, your equity is $100,000, you paid it off in full. And the typical profits from a subway are forty to 60000 a year. What, but instead, you decide, you know what, uh, I'm going to put $10,000 down and borrow $90,000 and have 10 locations. So now you're putting the same amount of money, you're investing the same 100000 but instead of getting one location, you're getting 10 locations. And you're earning 600000 for that $100,000 investment versus 60000 for the $100,000 investment. So that's how you look at return to equity. You look at the money you put down versus the profits you're generating, not the total value of the company. That's other, other ratios would do that. So, so for investors, you're really interested in return to equity. And you could break down the return to equity by Return assets times the equity multiplier. What is the equity multiplier? It's total assets divided by total shareholders' equity. So if we look at the, the, we're basically getting a percentage of the assets that's funded by shareholders' equity, or a multiplier. So the assets could be a million, the equity could be 100,000, meaning you put $100,000 down, you, bo you borrowed 900,000 to get a million dollars worth of assets, but since you only put 100,000 down, your multiplier is 10. So whatever the return on assets are, you're going to multiply by 10. Um, so you want to know uh, why the return on equity is moving up or down. Because if, remember, a company that's very highly leveraged and, prof and profitable tends to have a very high return on equity versus a company that's more uh, paid off. But Companies that are more highly leveraged are riskier. So you could have a company that has a higher return on equity, but, and everything else could be the same in another company, but their return on equity is lower. That might not mean you might not make a buy decision based on that, because you want to look at the risks. Is, you know, so the return on equity is really not comparable between companies unless they have a similar amount of outstanding debt. Um, because you want to understand how the firm is managing its asset, their, their assets and operations. So you have to really interpret return to equity. You can't just look at the percentage and say, OK, this company has a 40% return to equity company A. Company B has a 30% return to equity. So you should buy company A. It's not clear cut like that. You would have to look into it and, and say, I, I wanted to support buying company A. I would also have to say that company A has a similar percentage of debt to assets as company B and a similar effectiveness in managing its assets and operations. So with you know, basically the same debt exposure, the same assets and operations, company A is getting you much more return on equity than company B because they're able to use their assets more effectively, more efficiently. So when you look at return on, on equity, you really have to understand the risks the company is putting in place on the debt they have. Because the higher the debt you have, the higher equity multiplier. Because if you're putting very little down on a lot of assets, your equity multiplier is going to be high. So that, in that case, the higher the equity multiplier, sometimes the riskier the company. So that's why you can have a risky company that's going to show a higher return on equity. Just like I said before with the Subway franchises, if you have 10 locations, there's a good chance that some of those locations um, are not going to do as well as other locations. But there's also a good chance that th there's a definite uh, factor that if you're borrowing 90% of the money for that location, you have to pay interest on that. So it, makes, it raises the bar for your profitability. So if you have one location completely paid off, you don't have those interest payments. So you can be more profitable at that one location than the location when you borrow more money. Same thing with a house. If your house is completely paid off, it's much more affordable to live there, right? And it's less risk 
that there's no risk of foreclosure and there's less risk that you won't be able to afford to live there because the, the place is paid off and you're not paying any interest. However, if you do have a mortgage and you only put 10% down in the house, you're significantly and dramatically increasing the cost of a home. So, you know, for example, a home, a $500,000 home with a mortgage may cost you uh, $3,500 a month to live there in, uh, for the mortgage payments, which is interest and taxes. However, you pay that house off, it may go down to only um, $1,000 a month just paying the taxes, no interest. So $3,500 versus the $1,000 monthly payment, it's a lot more stable and a lot more, uh, less riskier for you to live in a house that's paid off. Uh, however, not everybody has the money to fully buy a business completely or buy a house completely. And in many cases, you don't want to have a business completely paid off when you can use leverage to buy, to, to buy new locations, expand the business, and grow the business. So you don't want to it's, it's a bad idea for companies to hamper their growth by, by being afraid to take on debt or leverage. You want to um, grow when the growth is there. So all these ideas and concepts have to go into analyzing and talking about return on equity to fully understand the company's position in relationship to their return on equity. So what you like is you like a company whose return on equity is increasing and their actual debt percentages are decreasing. So they're paying off their debt uh, but they're also generating more profits. So even though they're paying off their debt and they have more equity that they have to generate a profit for, they're managing to generate a higher profit for that equity. So that would be the best case scenario that the company is increasing their return on equity at the same time that the equity pool is increasing and they're doing that by uh, more efficient use of the assets to generate more sales and more profits. And that's the best case scenario when you're analyzing return to equity. So a lot of times return to equity is best to be analyzed in a trend analysis from year over year in relationship interior into the company itself. I don't really like to compare return to equity between companies in the industry because it, it could be, and there's too many variables that the other companies, are not, they're not really uh, compatible or comparable because they have different equity and debt landscapes. So you really want to look at how the company has been managing its own return on equity and hopefully they're, they're generating more profits uh, and paying down debt at the same time to increase this return on equity. So it takes a fair amount of understanding of the variable, breaking it down to its core components in the financial statement and getting an idea of what they're improving and what they're not improving. So you don't want to see return on equity increase by the company taking on more debt. Um, that wouldn't be a good way to increase return on equity. It's not, it's not necessarily a bad way, but a better way is to pay down debt and increase profits organically without having to uh, increase the leverage of the company to increase the profits. All right. it, um, continuing with this, so the amount of profits earned on each dollar invested by a shareholder. Uh, measures the management's efficiency in using the shareholder fund. So that's the core concept of recurrent on equity. I, give, I invest a dollar in a business, and how, how much profits can they generate out of that dollar? You know? So say I, give, um, I buy equity in a company, I give them $10,000. And then that company takes that $10,000, borrows some more money, expands their business, and winds up generating a significant amount of money based on an initial $10,000 investment that's going to show up in the return on equity. So if they don't generate profits for that money I, I invested in the company as far as equity, then that's going to be a negative return. Return on equity could actually be negative if the company has a net loss. So we're really just measuring how effective management is in, in converting my investment in the company, which is equity, into profits. And the higher the ratio, the better. The lower or negative is worse. But like I said before, you really have to dig into the number to analyze how, how it's changing. Is it changing from uh, good inputs or, or is it changing from less desirable inputs? So the good inputs would be um, reducing debt and increasing profits. If you can, you can increase your return on equity while simultaneously helping to lower your leverage, that's a very strong return on equity number. However, if you're increasing your return on equity by shrinking your, your equity pool, then that's not really as good of a number. Because 
um, you're just creating a more leveraged company, not necessarily a more efficient company. And don't be upset right now if you don't fully understand what I'm saying. If you think about this, you go back to the textbook, you read over this section, you look at some financial statements, that's the only way it's going to click. It's not going to click 100% when I'm talking to you about it today. I'm just introducing the idea. So now you have the concept that you don't just go by the variable, the, the result of the ratio, you have to investigate it. And while you're investigating or you're keeping that concept in mind, and the book does a good job explaining this uh, if you didn't catch everything today, you're going to slowly understand um, the, the variables that can affect the return on equity and why that's a good or bad thing for a company. And just use your, your knowledge already. You know that companies, the more leveraged they are, the more debt they take on, the riskier they, they are, the less desirable they are. So if companies are taking on a lot of debt, which makes, um, if they take on a lot of debt, they're, hopefully they're using that debt to expand or grow the company. If that new debt they're taking on isn't generating as much profits as the equity they already have, that return equity is, is, is it, may go, it, it will go up, but it's not going to go up as efficiently as it should. So you have to look at, okay, return equity went up 10%, but what was the cost of increasing that return equity? They took on a huge amount of debt to do that and made the comp put the company in a much riskier position. So I wouldn't say that was a good increase of return on equity. So not all increases of return on equity are necessarily better. Some are, are done in a way that's not as good for the company, and that's tied to risk. If they're going to increase the risk of the company to expand their return on equity multiplier, then that's an issue. So if you look at two companies like McDonald's and Yum Brands, Yum Brands again is KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, Yum Brands has higher return on equity than McDonald's. But that's because they're more leveraged. They have much more debt than McDonald's, who doesn't have as much debt. Um, so most of McDonald's is equity, not debt. So if McDonald's has a huger equity pool, their profits have to be divided by the equity pool, they're going to have a lower return on equity. But they're much less risky. So I'd much rather have, say, a 20% return on equity from McDonald's that is almost no risk versus a 30% return on Yum Brands Corporation that has a significant amount of risk because they have over 50% debt. So you see how the two numbers aren't comparable. It, McDonald's number looks lower, which this would say is worse than Yum Brands. But I feel like everybody agrees the Yum Brands return on, on equity is not as good as McDonald's because they're so highly leveraged. And that's why I say it's hard to really compare return equity between companies even in the same industry. You really want to look more at the trend analysis to say, over the last five years, have they grown return on equity? And did they do that by increasing profits or did they do that by increasing leverage? So if it's increasing leverage, it's not really a positive thing. It's not necessarily a negative thing as long as it's managed appropriately. But if they're increasing it through profits as the majority, that's a really good return on equity number. So if your return on equity goes up 10 percentage points and it's from becoming a more efficient and more profitable company without having to increase the leverage, then that's a really great buy signal for a company. So we want to determine the company's profitability. Is it increasing or decreasing and why? Now, return to equity is going to emphasize the key components in, in, in earnings and dividend growth. So that's why a lot of analysts also like return to equity because if the equity is getting a high amount of return, that looks, um, that's a good situation for increasing dividends as well or potential dividend growth. So if you're, in, you're analyzing an industry or a company that pays dividends uh, and you see that there's a, a, there's a strong return to equity um, from profits, uh, and the key component here, like I said, is earnings, and the, uh, the return on equity is going up because there's earnings, not more debt, then that's a good uh, buy signal for a company, especially if they're paying dividends because they're more likely to have money to pay more dividends. Now here, earnings per share is return on equity times the book value per share. So book value per share is basically equity per share. It's assets minus liabilities equals equity divided by sh outstanding shares, you get your book value per share. We've already discussed this. So if you take your return equity and multiply it by book value per share, you get your earnings per share. That's another way of calculating earnings per share. Um, so for a typical company, using debt to finance part of the assets, return equity um, will be larger than return on assets if you're using debt. So, we just, so if that's the case, we just need to understand 
and we need to point out to potential investors, yes, the company was able to, um, um, was able to increase its return on equity, and the return on equity is larger than return on assets because they use debt to finance its assets. So you would just want to point it out, that the return on equity is, for the most part, due to borrowing money uh, to grow the company and grow the profits. But anything that's leveraged comes with more risk, you know, which you, you, we've learned when we talked about using margin and buying stock. Anytime you leverage up something to, gen, to generate additional profits, you're going to have a higher return on your money, your return to equity, but it's coming at a riskier point of view. So that just needs to be pointed out to investors, saying, yes, return to equity is up, and that's a good thing, but it's primarily done through increasing the debt. And you can only see that when you're comparing year over year. Last year to this year, did debt increase? Yes, debt did increase, and um, that's why return on, on equity increased. So it's important to point that out. Now, let's go, we're gonna switch into common stock ratios, so we're moving out of financial ratios. I'm going to go back, we're going to go into common stock ratios, which is more stock market oriented. So the price to earnings ratio is probably the most important ratio that needs to be talked about in analyzing a company. So it shows you, it's sort of like um, a like factor on Facebook. And you look at some funny video or picture on Facebook and you see a million likes and you know that, wow, this really struck a chord with Facebook viewers. And it's the same thing, the price to equity ratio is like a, how many times people click like on a stock. And clicking like for a stock is actually buying it. So every time you buy a stock, it's like clicking like on it and, and, uh, or recommending it to a friend. You know, so if it's Twitter, it'd be how many times was this retweeted? And for stocks, how many times did someone tell somebody else to go and buy it? And that shows you the popularity. So price to earnings is really a popularity contest. And the higher the PE multiple, the more people like or have retweeted the stock. Um, so P PE is simply the net price of the common stock divided by the earnings per share. So we want to see how many times the stock price is in relationship to earnings per share. So the idea is how much should I pay for a particular amount of earnings? So if I'm buying one share of stock and it has $5 earnings per share, how much should I pay for that? Should, uh, definitely five times, and that'd make it a $25 stock. 10 times, would make a $50 stock. 20 times, um, $100 stock. So if I like a stock enough that I think it's worth it to pay 20 times the earnings, I, for $5 earnings per share, I would pay $100. So I feel that 20 times earnings was, uh, was appropriate for that company. And that means I really like the stock. If some stocks are unliked, and they may have a PE, say, figure the average is between 15 and 18 historically. If stock with a 10 PE is not liked, people only, only value it as much as 10 times earnings. So the higher the ratio, not necessarily the better, but the more expensive or the more liked the stock. And I look at a high PE ratio saying that there's something about the stock that investors like and generally what investors like is the, the, the possibility of higher capital gains and profits in the future. So if a company, investors feel that a company has a chance to be more profitable in the future, they will pay a higher PE multiple today in order to be um, in the mix for the higher profits later. So, when you look at your, your companies and you see a company, that ha your company that you might be recommending has a high PE, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You would want to, you would want to state that oh, this company has a high PE because investors already recognize the, the uh, strong potential for this company to produce more profits in the future. And I feel as an analyst that this company will even exceed the current PE expectations in the future and that's why I consider this a buy a stock to buy because even though it has a high PE in relationship to its market, it still has, um, a in, in my estimation, a higher potential to make even more money in the future. And so the PE that it's currently selling at, even though it's a high PE in relationship to the peers, I feel is undervalued in relationship to the company's future performance. Is typically how, when I write an analyst report, I would say something like that. If I'm, if I'm giving a buy recommendation to a high PE stock, 
I need to justify it and uh, validate why I'm doing that. You know, and I have to recognize, I realize it's a high PE, but you know, stock, generally stocks with high PEs keep going higher because these are the stocks that are doing well and have a good business model and, and are hot right now and have the momentum. Uh, in some cases, you may find what's called a value stock with a low PE that is too low. The stock's been overly punished, the stock's been overly neglected, but the story and the profits of the company are going to be too great to deny in the future and you're expecting the PE to increase. That would be a situation where stock with a low PE you're giving a buy rating to, you need to explain why it has the low PE and why you expect it to move up higher in the future. So earnings per share is just you know pretty simple calculation. It's the you know the um, earnings of the company divided by the outstanding shares, and then the price to earnings ratio is the stock price per share divided by the earnings per share. So the calculation is fairly simple. But what's not so simple is really under interpreting the company's P/E ratio in rel relative to its future potential. That's where you have to go with P/E ratio. Is that do you feel that the current P/E ratio um, is low for the, compared to the company's future potential? So again, the P/E ratio, like the return to equity, is something that you look more internally to the company. You don't necessarily always compare it to other companies in the industry. You know, um, you can reflect on that and say that it, this company has a higher P/E than its peers, but the reason for that is it can. It commands a superior market share and has a superior pipeline of future products. Just like if you're going to look at, say, you know, a PE of a company like Apple compared to another company that makes tablets and, and um, cell phones. That's not as in strong a position. Okay, so the peg ratio is a, a very good ratio for letting you know valuation of a company. So here's a, a, a ratio that's also a good valuation model in, in itself. So we look at the stock's P-E ratio in relationship to either a three or five year growth rate in earnings. So it's sort of an average growth rate in earnings over five years. We'll take the five year one. Uh, so the idea is that the P-E ratio should be a similar uh, multiple that's relatable to growth. So if you took the growth in the company, say it was 20%, multiply it by 100, you get 20, okay? Uh, so we want to take the P-E ratio divided by that growth rate, and that basically gives us um, a hopefully a multiple somewhere around one. Now, one is what we consider to be um, in line with growth, earnings growth. So one is what we consider to be uh, the intrinsic value of a company. So if, if, it's, if the P-E is 20 and the growth rate of the company is 20, but you have to kind of multiply the percentage by 100 to get like a round number. So 20 divided by 20, we get one. So if the, the P-E ratio is, is um, on par with the growth in earnings, the company is fairly valued. So if you have a, a company that's growing at 50% a year for the last five years, it's a 50% growth in earnings, it should have a P-E of 50. If it's at a 10% growth in earnings, it should have a P-E of 10. Now, if the ratio is greater than one, the, the stock may be fully or overvalued. So if, if the P-E ratio is 50 and the growth, earn, the, the growth rate in earnings is 25 and you have a peg ratio of two, it's overvalued. If it's less than one, it could be undervalued. So if you have a P-E of 20 um, and a growth rate of 30 and it's under one, then you would look at that company's undervalued. The P-E multiple should be at least um, the same number as the growth rate. And if, if the PE is less than the growth rate, you have an undervalued stock in your hands, and that's a good value indicator saying this is stock to buy because the peg ratio is under one. It's sort of like a quick valuation model. And again, Yahoo Finance lists peg ratio. Um, you could calculate it, but sometimes it's easier for this one ratio not to calculate, but just to take out of Yahoo Finance, like the beta also. If you need a beta uh, coefficient, don't calculate that yourself. Just take it off of Yahoo Finance. It's one of the exceptions where most everything else I want you to calculate from the raw financial statements, but 
Um, you don't have to do that for the peg ratio or say the beta coefficient. It's just not necessary. They're pretty accurate as to what you get. Okay, so dividends per share. We understand this pretty easily. Then this again, these are when you're looking at different industries, dividends are more important than other industries. But the dividend per share just shows you the um, annual dividends paid to, uh, share, to common stockholders and the number of common stocks outstanding. So the total amount of money and dividends paid versus the amount of outstanding shares. So we get the dividend per share. Um, the payout ratio looks at the dividends per share divided by the earnings per share. So the idea is that you can't pay more dividends than the earnings per share that you make. So if you make $5 in earnings, the most you can pay in dividends is $5. Um, so, you wanna, so, so some companies, you want to know how much of their earnings they're actually paying out as dividends. So if a company is paying an attractive dividend and it's only 5% of the earnings, that would be a better position than a company that has the same dividends but is paying it using 30% of the earnings to pay the dividend. You know, uh, so the more earnings per share they have that's not being paid out as, as dividends, the more potential they have for converting that earnings per share into dividends. So that's for dividend-dependent stocks, sometimes you're, it's interesting to see what the payout ratio is. And if it's paying a good dividend and that is actually a low payout ratio, that means the company has a good chance or good ability to increase dividends more in the future because they're only paying out a small percentage right now. And book value per share, which we talked about earlier, um, the common shareholders' equity divided by the number of outstanding shares. So um, the company should always be worth more than its book value. If the company's only worth, if the company's equal to the book value, then you would say that th there's no value to the business. It's only equal, it's only worth the assets. So there was, there was a time where um, the book value of Apple, and say, of the late 1990s, the book value of Apple was, this, was very close to the stock price, or almost equal. So there was a point in the 1990s, at the end of the 1990s, where they said Apple's business wasn't worth more than its assets. This is pre-iPod. That's what really turned things around. So if you, had, if you, if you looked at the Apple, Apple company, you may have agreed because their, their laptops and PCs were terrible. They had no iPad, no iPhone, no iPods, and they, they had no Steve Jobs. So, and they were getting close to, to um, you know, their sales and profits were declining. So nobody really liked them. Um, and their book value per share was um, close to the stock price or at their stock price. So there was really no, people saw no potential in Apple. So boy, were they wrong, because today, Apple trades uh, their book value per share um, um, is much lower percentage-wise than it ever was. So if you have, say, Apple has, um, say the stock is 300, or say the stock's 100, the book value may be $10 per share. So the stock's trading um, 10 times its book value. Uh, now, most companies, there's sort of, if it's, if the book value is higher than the stock price, that's a sell situation. So if you have any of your companies where the book value is above its stock price, that's a real warning sign or a good stock for a sell recommendation. Typically, we like it when um, we get a range of somewhere between, the book value is somewhere between 50 to 75% of the stock price. So if the stock was uh, $50 and the book value was $25, that would be in a 50% range. That would be pretty acceptable. If the book value per share gets to be under 20%, that may signal that the stock's a little overvalued because if the stock, you know, if the book value is only 20% of the total stock price, the stock price may be getting, be getting away from the actual value of the company. But again, this has to be looked at per industry and per company because certain industries run very 
small book values in relationship to stock price in certain industries compared to other industries. For example, the auto industry, the book value is much closer to the stock price than, say, the computer industry. So you have to look at your industry averages. And this is a good one where you can get the average for the industry and kind of relate your stock to the industry average. And again, it's not, it's not really that significant of an indicator unless it's extreme. If it falls within, if everybody's pretty much within an average range, uh, give or take one or two standard deviations, that's fine. But when it gets extreme, that's a warning sign that the company's complete, too overvalued or too undervalued. Okay, so the price to book ratio is looking at, this is what I was talking about for the multiple. So stock price dividing about, divided by book value gives us a multiple. So if it's $100 stock price and a $10 book value per share, we would say it's trading 10 times book. Or book to price value would be 10. So this just gives you a multiple of how many times the stock price is uh, um, of the book value. So the higher this ratio, the more fully priced or overpriced the stock is. And the lower the ratio may mean that the stock is fairly or underpriced. But then again, this has a lot to do with risk. So companies that have a low price to book value generally have high risk. Uh, because investors recognize the risk and they are trading the stock lower. So as the stock is approaching the book value, so the book value, stock price equals book value, there's no risk. That means that I could take the company, sell all the assets, pay off all the liabilities, and meet my stock price. So there's no real risk there. But when the book value, um, the stock price becomes higher, much higher than the book value, there could be a risk. Because if the business shuts down, they may owe more than, um, I'm sorry, the stock price could only be supported by a small amount of assets for the company. So a $50 stock price and a book value of $5 per share, that means if it went bankrupt and all the liabilities were paid, you as a stock investor would only see $5 out of your $50 paid back to you if everything was efficiently sold off. So it, puts, it means the company is a little bit riskier in case it defaults. But for companies where there's no real chance of default, it can support a higher book to price multiple. It's not an issue. And again, think of book value as you know, the equity value of the company, what I own. So you don't want to, unless it's a really good opportunity at a low risk, you don't really want to pay 10 times the book value of a company. It's like saying there's a car that the book value of the car is $5,000. Would you want to pay $10,000 for that car? No, you'd probably want to pay $5,000. You want to pay the book value of that car. You know, how, you know, however, if this car is um, a car that can run on water or something magical about it, and you know that, but most other people don't know that, you might be willing to pay more than book value just to get that car. And that's sort of like what stocks are. If you could find a stock that most people think it's, you know, it's worth this much, but there's something about this stock that you really know or intuitively feel that the market for this, their products or their future potential is going to be greater than most people realize, that's when you want to pay more than the book value for the stock. And for most companies that are operating, their future potential is stronger than their current position. So in that case, you wanna, you're willing to pay more for it, just like that car scenario. And that's why this is just a measure of that. Okay. So interpreting financial ratios. Now, there are sources of financial ratios that investors look at in you know, Standard & Poor, brokerage firm reports. Uh, there are many sources of getting financial ra ana uh, ratios or analysis where other other people have looked at the financials and come up with their own analysis. Um, however, that's, you're not exactly sure what point in time they collected the data and did the analysis, because she, things change on a daily basis. So it's ideal for stock analysis um, to know exactly what the data is, where it's from, and, uh, to give you an idea of how accurate your analysis is. So ideally, if you could have um, daily financial statements for the company that are creating daily financial ratios, that would be the base, best case scenario. But we simply don't have access to that type of information. Nobody does unless you're really inside the company. So we're always working as analysts, we're working with prior financial information from the prior period, the prior year. So that's always um, an issue with is, is how, how far apart 
is your analysis from when the data is recorded. And for the, some of these people, sometimes when you get these brokerage firm reports and you have analysts talking about uh, companies and making recommendations, they could be very old, you know, so, and they could be out of date. Um, but they are out there, and the good ones you have to pay for. But this, this class is not about reading other people's analyst reports or getting other people's data. It's about interpreting your, getting the actual raw data, interpreting it yourself the best you can. Um, now, as far as interpreting financial ratios, we want to, it's important to look at the, the history of the company or the trend ratio. Uh, so the company, not, you have to do this for every company industry, but the companies that you're actually writing about, you want to go in for the last four or five years and see, just like, just pretend you're a college administrator and you have to review someone's application for being accepted into a prestigious university. You're going to want to see that the trend of these people have been, I started out okay, but I kept improving. I kept building on my GPA, doing better in my courses, taking harder courses, getting better grades, taking on internships, building a real success story. So at the end, you're, yes, you would definitely be admitted to the G, this graduate program or would definitely would accept you for this job. A lot of jobs now also want to see your transcripts and your grades and what you did, they want to talk about what you did in college. Were you, did you have an internship? Were you a leader on an academic um, club or team or sports team? So stocks are similar to that. You want to see the trend. Is they been, have they been progressing nicely or are they on a downward slide? Uh, and of course you want to re relate the ratios to the industry. In some cases you want to get a baseline. So the industry average is a good baseline. And it's always a good thing to say that on this ratio, the company routinely beats the industry or is currently doing better than the industry. Because if a company can have ratios that are all better than the industry, then it's typically a good reason to buy that company. If they're beating their competition, which is evident through their ratios, that's always a good story to tell. Now sometimes you want to evaluate these ratios relative to one or two other uh, strong com contenders in the industry. So you may have an industry of 10, 12 stocks, but there's really only two or three companies that are the top of the industry, that are the strongest companies. So sometimes you may not want to look at the entire industry, but you may want to look at those two or three top contenders and, and compare them to, you know, um, so if you're looking at McDonald's, you may compare them to Yum! Brands or Burger King, but you might not care so much how they compare it to Checkers or Sonic or some of the smaller players because it might be more relevant to see how they only compare it to the bigger, more similar companies. Um, is, now, each piece of the financial, each financial ratio is a small piece of the story. So you want to construct to see if the information is telling you a good story about the company. So each piece is sort of a, um, an artifact of what's happening. And you want to assemble them in a way to see if, if this overall telling a good story. Or because some people try to recommend a stock on one or two ratios and ignoring five or six or seven other ratios that you know, maybe go in the other direction. So you're really looking for how the financial ratios relate to each other and how they make a good case or good story for buying the company. Uh, and this story is what the story narrative that you're, you're creating for the company using the financial ratios to support it is how you're going to support your intrinsic value or explain why you feel the company has intrinsic value and that it's a good buy for an investor. Now, to be fair and to warn you, uh, companies' financial statements can have problems. Uh, so if inventories and receivable, receivables are growing faster than sales, that's a warning sign it should be, and should be stipulated in your analyst report. So if sales are growing, that's why you do the trend analysis. It gives you um, uh, increase in sales. Sales increased by 20% this this year, over last year. However, uh, inventories and receivables are increasing at 30 and 40 percentage points. So that's a warning sign because you um, makes a company riskier. If they have more receivables, it's a riskier company. If they're growing inventory, it's a riskier company. <clears throat> if, the, if you have a falling current, current ratio caused by current liabilities increasing faster than current assets, another warning sign. Uh, a high and rapidly increasing debt to equity ratio. 
So if the debt to equity ratio, it means you're taking in more debt in relationship to the size of your equity, that uh, could be a future uh, solvency problem. They could, they could have a financing problem in the future or be bankrupt. Cash flow from operation is dipping below net income. So if cash flow from operation is shrinking and net income is increasing, it could be increasing from uh, uh, other avenues, that's, that's a really bad sign because you always want cash flow uh, from operations to be above the net income. Um, if there's a presence of a lot of off-balance sheet type of accounts or extraordinary income entries, um, if, it's, if it seems that the company's footnotes or, finan or, or balance sheet is complicated with all these special entities or off-balance sheet accounts or re exceptions or you need to point them out or at least be uh, uh, weary of them. You know, uh, one such thing is, it's related but not 100% identical, is the company may have won a large lawsuit last year. It's a one in a lifetime type of lawsuit. A couple years ago, TiVo, or maybe last year, TiVo won a big lawsuit. So that year, their earnings per share looked great and it just looked there, all their financial ratios looked fantastic. But it was because of this tax windfall that they're not going to duplicate next year. It wasn't from operations, it was from a special uh, situation. So sometimes that has to be mentioned, or that could be a reason for better um, financial ratios. Okay, so that's finally the end of fundamental analysis. And again, what I just want to drive home here is that it's not just stating that these ratios um, are higher and better than these ratios of the other company, and that's why you should buy the company. You can't just say it's higher and that's better and you buy the company. You have to really support it with facts. Why is it higher or why is this ratio better than the other companies? So sometimes a little support of, you know, so if you're going to make a buy recommendation for a company, you need to list supporting bullets of why it's a buy recommendation. And one of them could be because their return on equity is higher. But you should always add to that, the return on equity is higher than their peers or growing faster than their peers. And what, what I, why I'm considering this a buy recommendation is because their return on equity is being built upon their increase in profits, not necessarily their increase in leverage. Some of the other companies have been increasing their return on equity, but that's been doing, they've been doing so by increasing their debt. You know, so that just shows that you understand the ratio and you have a good rationale for why it's a, it's a buy ratio for your company. So whenever you make your um, analyst report and you're going to have to have summarized somewhere in the, in the report your, say, top 10 list of why you should buy this company or top 10 facts or supporting pieces of information of why you feel this company is a buy. And you should always put a descriptive um, rationale behind the number. So don't just state the number, also state why it's good and why you feel the stock price uh, will increase because of this information in the future.